Good morning students. Today we will continue with chapter 3 of the session organizational behavior which we started and we came to know like what is organizational behavior, then what leads to effectiveness of the organization. Today chapter 3 will deal with social systems and organizational culture. Here in this chapter we will mainly try to find out like what is the importance of a social system and why organization is a social system, what we do within a social system and next we will come to know about the organizational culture, various factors involved in organizational culture, um, how it is related with organizational performance and other things. So, the objective of this chapter mainly is understanding the social system the psychological contract, social culture, role, status, understanding organizational culture, organization socialization, characteristics of effective socialization, impact of organizational culture on performance and satisfaction, creating an ethical organizational culture, creating a customer responsive culture, spirituality and organizational culture influencing culture change, sustaining the culture, mergers, organizational culture and cultural leadership. So, this whole lecture will be spread through 2 hours and in the first hour we will cover till the status of the organization and in the next lecture we will continue with understanding organizational culture and topics thereafter. So, to start with we will try to understand what is a social system. Social system is nothing but it is a complex set of human relationships which are interacting in many way. If we come to understand in a social system there are number of people as we enter as people enter the organization. It is a um, number of people they come together with their own abilities, personality pattern, their value system, their attitudes, their inherent inbuilt ideas about themselves and they come and interact with other people. With this predetermined setup, two people come and interact and they exchange their views. As a result, what happens? A group formation happens one person interact with the other person, the second person interacts with the third person, as a result a small group is formed and these interaction may be of various nature, it may be like of cooperative in nature, it may be conflicting in nature, there can be a power dynamics within this interaction. So, interactions are of various natures and in after that interaction what happens small groups are formed these groups are again it is a small system, it is a subsystem of a larger group. This larger group again is a subsystem of the whole organization. So, what happens if you can just see like if you consider this to be the organization, the bigger circle to be the organization within this organization small groups form. These are called subsystems and what happens these subsystems are also interacting with each other and within this again there are smaller subsystems which are interacting with each other. This whole interactions, this whole pattern of interactions what happens one from the other this effect on this, this as a larger group has an effect on the external environment, external environment has an effect on the this subsystem or the system which we call over here as the organization leads to a broad spectrum of behavior. And what happens? These relationship can have a direct or indirect, these interactions can have direct or indirect effect on the behavior 
of a single person, this large, large group can affect the behavior of this person over here. This group can affect directly affect the behavior of the person over here. This group can also indirectly affect the behavior of person who is within this group. So, be the so in social systems what happen a set of behavior patterns develop which may directly or indirectly affect the behavior of others present within the same system or a different subsystem. And what happens next point is all are mutually interdependent, all sub parts of the organization are mutually interdependent each affecting the behavior of the other. Now, this whole system is in interaction with the external environment and as a result what happens it gives like signals to the external environment and it also receives input from the external environment. As a result what happens there is a, again dynamics of relationship the changes in the external environment affects the organization. Organization also sometimes brings certain changes and it sends ripples to the external environment and awareness is generated, interest is generated in the environment about that organization. And when this whole interaction, this whole interaction as you see is maintained in a stable state when all the there is a balance between this the signals sent the inputs and the throughputs and the outputs when there is a balance between all these things then what we call is a state of social equilibrium you call it as a state of social equilibrium when there is a balance between the working balance between this interactions of the sub parts as we mentioned over here, then this stage is called social equilibrium. We, now, this as you understand as if you can remember what we discussed in the chapter 1 of the session is individuals come with their own input, they become members of groups, groups also interact with each other as a result and they interact with the organizational system which interacts with the environment and as a result the environment as a whole has an effect on each of these parts and as a result what happens an output in the form of human and organizational performance is what is obtained at the end. Now, when this is that, when there, this is the organization is a social system, is a big social system, what happens next important point which occurs over here, which is very much connected with this is the concept of psychological contract. Psychological contract, if you can understand from this, these is this word itself consists of two sub parts one is psychological and the other is contract. When we are speaking of the word contract it means like there is a mutuality of understanding like one will provide something to the other like it is a give and take sort of relationship you give me certain things you agree to give me certain things and in return I agree to give you certain things. This is called contract. Now, what happens when an employee joins an organization, the contract that he enters into with the organization is of course, um, you have to sign a bond like rules and regulations that you have to abide by as a result of being in the organization that you sign a bond when you enter and I, in return of it organization promises you to give certain financial benefits in terms of your salary and other things. 
that is the usual employment contract that people enter into when they first step into the organization. But when they start staying within the organization and also some expectations which are not generally mentioned at the time when you are joining, but it is expected from you from the day one is certain it is a both way expectation. You also do not mention like I expect this when you join an organization, organization also does not mention that you are expected to do certain things. These are unwritten unsaid expectations as we may call and these are called psychological contracts means beyond the financial contract that you are having with your organization, there is another form of contract which is called the psychological contract which is expected of an employee from the employer like I expect you to do certain things. Also in return employee wants certain things from the employer, these are expectations that you join with and these are expectations from you when you join an organization. So, it is an expectations from the both the parties the employee side and the employer side. So, we will come to know what is psychological contract major work on this area has been done by guest in 2002 we will have a look into this what is psychological contract. Psychological contract is the mutual obligation, this word is very important, mutual obligation and expectation of the two parties both for, for the employer and the employee from each other. And it is more influential than the formal contract because it provides, it leads to your satisfaction within the organization, whether you love to be within that organization whether you love to work within that organization depends to a great extent on the fulfillment of the psychological contract from the employer to the employee and whether the employee is also loved by the employer or not, whether you are uh, become a star performer or not depends to a large extent on the employer's expectation from you and you fulfilling that expectation. So, what you can see is guest he defined psychological contract as the perceptions of the two parties employee and employer of what their mutual obligation are towards each other. And it is like it, it is suggested that the it depends a lot on the employer's uh, perception of the how to deal with the management. We dealt with the effectiveness chapter in the last class and if you find if you can remember we told much about the changes brought in the adaptability and other things. So, it depends to a large extent on the management practices adopted by the um, organization to make the environment of the organization the more like where employees can perform well more employee friendly and also from the employees perspective it depends a lot on the justice and fairness given to them within the organization how you are distributing your reward who is getting the reward what you expect what are do you expect too much from us and all these factors small small factors which shows like whether the organization is just and fair matters a lot to the employees. And when it leads when the psychological contract is positive it um, leads to a better commitment and satisfaction on the part of the employees and it leads to positive business performance. We will now have a look into the kinds of different kinds of commitment and if you can see like on the employees promise to work hard to uphold company reputation 
maintain high levels of attendance and punctuality, show loyalty to the organizations, work extra hours when required, develop new skills and update old ones, be flexible by taking on a colleague's work, maybe it's for example, be courteous to clients and colleagues, be honest, come up with new ideas. These are what employers expect of the employees and they promise to do so. Next is employers promise to provide pay commensurate with performance, opportunities for training and development, opportunities for promotion, recognition for innovation or new idea, feedback on performance, in providing the employees with interesting tasks and attractive benefits package, respectful treatment, reasonable job security, a pleasant and safe work environment. Now, of all these things which is listed on the right hand side where employers promise to provide. Now, with the changing time, with the changing time some of these things especially reasonable job security with the changing nature of the job with the changing demands this reasonable job security is what maybe employers cannot provide and also with the changing nature of the employees this is what they do not want also as a result psych the concept of psychological contract has also evolved like it's it has undergone some change from what we call the traditional concept of psychological contract to the present time when we are dealing with the concept of psychological contract and it has like undergone some changes and now what we deal with mainly is first is very important like employability. So, as job security cannot be guaranteed due to the changing nature of the job changing demands of the situation because we are now in a globalized atmosphere. So, what the as employers cannot provide job security per se, what they can look into is developing the employability of the employee means developing a portfolio of skills, knowledge, competencies which will make them more marketable like so it is a focus on human resource development, training you and upgrading your skills so that even if I cannot employ you due to various reasons, but you are well equipped to um, find any other job in the marketplace according to your like skill set that you have, the competencies that you have. Next is what is called a career. Now, when we are talking of career and a career ladder promotions and uh, what happens is that it, in organizations due to delaying, due to flattening of the organization as there are not too many of hierarchies present, this the concept of ladder is changing and in a flattened organization what happens is you maybe promotions cannot be based on it the path of promotion is not very smooth or you do not get that fast promotions because there are not too many hierarchies. So, what employers maybe can look into is like uh, job enrichment and enlargement uh, concepts and in that case what happens like um, you have to look into while recruiting employees like what what is the need of the employee will focus more on this uh, in the forthcoming chapters when we come to know like there are different types of employees according to their personality pattern and which or what is the nature of that employee which is going to suit my organization properly. If I cannot provide a 
good career ladder as per the expectation. If a person has very high expectation and I cannot provide that to the employee, then later on maybe that person will become very dissatisfied with joining that organization. So, I have to find out what motivates that person, what is what that person is seeking from the organization in terms of career when we, that person is joining the organization and this comes under the purview of career development and management. When we are talking of work life balance, it is an important link like people want now to distribute time between their family and their workplace. And if the organization allows you to do that thing, the structure of the organization, the policies that are present in the organization allows you to distribute your time properly between and keep a balance between your work life and your family life, people get more satisfaction from it and it strengthens the psychological contract because you are you as an organization is helping the employee to maintain a balance to become a holistic employee. So, a holistic uh, person. So, that is very important. Um, an employee is not just an employee, he has or she has other identities also as a family person, as a person of a society, member of certain other interest groups. Now, the organization which helps the person to balance all these identities, to maintain a balance between all these roles, then what happens? The person develops a positive feeling for the organization as a result psychological contract strengthens. And for organizational strategy planning, psychological contract may have many implications like one major implication is for the process fairness. This is one of the important issues like it is very important how you are doing your things. What, what you give as an end result is not that much important to the employees, but what is more important is the process you take whether you are fair enough in your judgment or whether you are taking like unfair practices, unfair measures, unfair distribution of rewards, there is favoritism within this organization or not. This is what matters a lot to the employees. So, process fairness is very important. Communications like whether you are you as an organization is communicating to the employees, whether you are taking them into confidence, whether you are treating them as one of very important part of your whole entity, this, this is important. Next is management style, which means like what is the style that you take. If you remember, we discussed about five management styles in the earlier chapter whether you are authoritative in nature, whether you are like a collegial in nature, all these things, whether the management is participative in nature or not, these practices helps it sends a signal, a com it develops a comfort zone for the employees to work within the organization. And if that comfort zone is developed, the person develops a positive feeling for the organization. So, management style helps to develop that comfort zone. Managing expectations like what do you expect from your employees? Are these expectations based on realistic assumptions or not? Is it based on like the contextual whether you have surveyed, you, you have taken care of the contextual factors before you are expecting something from your employee or you send, set very high expectations from your employee without realizing whether that person is equipped enough um, to do that things, whether the organization can provide the resources to the employees to do certain things that you expect from that employee. If you see like we discussed like the social system, in the social system every sub part is related to the 
other subpart and they directly or indirectly affect each other. So, it is very important to set a realistic assumptions about what you realistic expectation um, what you expect from your employees and also from the employees perspective it is also similarly applicable like managing your expectations from your organizations. Like if organization A is providing its employees with certain other th certain things it is not always true like organization B where you are working can provide you with the similar things because this organization has its own goals, it has its own constraints, it has its own environmental challenges with which it can meet certain parts of your expectations and may not meet, may not be equipped enough to meet certain parts of your expectations and you have to scale your expectations from the organization accordingly if you want to be with that same organization. Measuring employee attitudes is also important because psychological contract helps you to understand whether that person will be committed to that it, dep it, it is an important factor for commitment, job satisfaction, job involvement and also leading to behavioral patterns like employee engagement and organizational citizenship behavior. So, these are important factors which are connected to each other from like each of these concepts are connected to each other and it, it may lead to major decisions regarding how to change employee attitudes. Managing change like when you want to bring certain changes in the organization people with psychological contracts like has this is a major decision to be taken about what to do with these employees. These psychological contract may sometimes lead to bring proper changes greater degree of OCB or which develops from higher degree of psychological contract may lead to certain negative effects also where if you want to downsize if you want to like uh, flatten down sometimes and it is that you cannot move with all the employees that you have and it needs this different shape and structure to the organization to be given then people with higher degree of psychological contract which may lead to higher organizational citizenship behavior sometimes may be your like barriers may act as barriers to bring in newer changes for the organization and accordingly you have to handle these issues like how to bring in these changes because greater psychological contract with the organization higher degree sometimes generates a feeling of ownership in the employees which is sometimes which is expected but over over degree like it is too much of ownership about the organization sometimes act as sometimes may hinder in the process of bringing organizational changes. With this we move on to the concept of um, cultural diversity which is another important factor like within the show, when we discussed organization as a social system one of the major thing was the discussion about psychological contract. Now, the next important issue is of course, about cultural diversity. Cultural diversity why this is an important issue, why now we are more concerned with this because what happens the nature of the organization itself is changing when it is it is functioning in a global environment when it is functioning in a global environment what happens we are 
getting different inputs from different nations means in different nations where we are going to establishing our organizations and what happens the in national cultures vary national cultures vary as a result sets of values expectations vary people from different that there is a uh, people from different areas perspectives backgrounds age ethnic groups all come and become part of your organization so what we call there is a workforce diversity now there is a great workforce diversity and this we cannot ignore what we have to try to do is to utilize this workforce diversity to channelize it with the organization's performance so that a organization leads to excellence now to understand this workforce diversity what we have to understand is that there is a cultural diversity between amongst the employees this cultural diversity is what is diversity is in the different identities cultural diversity occurs because there is difference in cultural identities now what are these cultural identities is like the people come from different people come from different backgrounds like they belong to different social class gender wise they are different uh, then they are physiologically like eye color hair color all these things are different nationality is different and as a result they form certain identities of their own which are called cultural identities and they try to identify with this cultural identity people of the same cultural identity share certain world views certain perceived views about the like how everything is functioning these perceptions are called world views based on the cultural identities now these world views are certain norms they have their certain norms goal priorities etc certain norms goal priorities set and socio cultural heritage socio cultural heritage which are passed on like from one generation to the other generation socio cultural factors socio cultural factors these these herit all these things lead to cultural identities and people identify to different degrees with these cultural identities if you can see if you can follow over here the diversity in cultural identities leads to work group functioning and this also is dependent on work group diversity perspective leading to some intermediate group outcomes like quality of intergroup relations degree of feeling valued and respected meaning and significance of cultural identity at work we'll try to explain this slide we'll try to explain this slide slowly so that you can understand how this whole thing is functioning now cultural identity we have already mentioned like different groups identify different groups based on their backgrounds identify to certain norms goal priorities and socio cultural expectations now when we are talking of work group perspectives first is the learning integration and learning perspective in the integration and learning perspective what the employees do is the inside skills and experiences that the employees have developed as a members of various 
cultural identity groups, these are very valuable resources for them and they use it as a potential, they use it as a resource to um, rethink the way they look into the world, they redefine their markets, products and strategies and business practices that will advance the mission of the organization means what happens this perspective, the integration and learning perspective, it interlinks, it links the uh, asset, it, it looks into work group, workforce diversity is a major asset it is having and it utilizes this workforce diversity, it links the various perspectives, the various thought processes about coming from different cultures, the good good of every culture into its main work processes and try to excel and the organization tries to excel by drawing inputs from the good, good learning from all the culture and that is what it is called integrated and integration and learning perspective because I am learning from every culture what how to look into the world view, how to look into analyze the problem, how to find solutions to it, how to plan for future, all these different cultures based on their cultural identities, their own world view are providing me knowledge about it. The different sets of people have different skills also when in which they excel and I what I do I just make it come to a common place and holistically apply these skills to for the gain of the organization. Access and legitimacy perspective and access and legitimacy perspective on diversity is based in a recognition that organizations, markets and constituencies are culturally diverse. So, what it does is it tries to, it, it knows like because the market is culturally diverse. So, what I do is um, I just have a cultural diversity, workforce diversity, not because I consider it as a resource, important resource which will help me to grow and excel from within, but because keeping this diversity will help me to connect with a diverse market. And what I do not do, I do not incorporate the cultural competencies of that I get from different backgrounds due to workforce diversity into the main system of the organization. I maintain a workforce diversity just to gain access into different market setups because if the market sees like okay my people are over there so some soft corner is developed and maybe I get access into that market but I do not do not integrate these people into my main system. Discrimination and fairness perspective. It is characterized by a belief in a culturally diverse workforce as a moral imperative to ensure justice and fair treatment to all members of society. So, it is just, it is again, I want to appear to be a fair organization. I want to appear to be an equal opportunity organization. I want to pose like that. Uh, so, um, I am just keeping a diverse workforce, I am maintaining a balance. Um, so, and there is um, no link, no, no link with what I want to. I am not integrating these people, neither I am utilizing them for um, getting a, access into the market, nor I am trying to integrate them into the main system of the organization. I am just keeping this diverse maintaining this diversity because I want to appear to be a fair and just organization. So, if you can see now when we are talking of these perspectives like of this intermediate group outcomes, 
So, these are the intermediate group outcomes like what we call over co call like mediators. So, here what happens quality of intergroup relations are when I am trying to integrate all the different viewpoints together conflict yeah conflict appears conflict is there you cannot deny that the organization there is no conflict. So, but what happens um, there, there, there can be an open discussion possible based on the differences which are there and they can be integrated that the conflict this can be a functional conflict where we learn from each other and try to integrate those views into the organization. In access and legitimacy perspective what happens the conflict arises mainly due to the um, power and status uh, according to different uh, groups present in the organization and um, there is a little open discussion about it. In again discrimination and fairness perspective is it is mainly due to the status and power imbalances and um, it is stemming mainly from that how much um, share I am getting, how much importance one group is getting from the organization and how much importance the other group is not getting. The main issue is regarding this power imbalance and there is no open discussion sometimes about these conflicts. Yeah, being fully valued and respected when you are talking of integration and learning all the employees feel they are valued and respected because they are important contributors to the organization they, they, they are, their competence is valued by the organization. Then, um, but in the other two perspectives like they feel disrespected someone feel respected because they get importance in the power dynamic somebody feel disrespected and devalued because their competency is not utilized they are not important because um, they have something but they are used as a means for certain things like either to gain market share or or to appear like a other organization wants to appear like a fair organization. So, the employees are not the ends in themselves like their growth, their competencies, they, they are not the end in themselves, but they, their diversity is used as a means to get an end which is nowhere connected with their competencies and other things. Significance of own racial identity at work. So, the, these are like a resource for learning and teaching when you are talking of integration and learning, um, but it is a source of ambi while you are talking of access and legitimacy these are sources of ambivalence for employees of other colors and it is when you are talking of discrimination means maybe it is a source of powerlessness for people of color. Coming to group functioning what happens and while we feel like it is a integration and learning perspective it is it is enhanced by the cross cultural exposure and people mutually learn from each other. But in other two things while we are discussing access and legitimacy or discrimination and fairness if you see like group functioning is enhanced uh, by increase in access and legitimacy or in other case it is inhibited by low morale of the employees like because in these two the, these two types of organizations are not able to utilize the um, skill the competencies of the employees for like integrating them into the main system of the organization and somewhere there remains a weak link, they remain a weak link with the main system of the organization. So, these along with 
different perspectives. So, diversity in cultural identities with different diversity in perspective of the like how you view uh, what is the importance of that you give to this diversity will lead to different group outcomes leading to different types of work group functioning. Whether you give very high importance to these cultural diversities or you give moderate to low importance on your cultural identities and what you do with that perspective like whether you want to integrate them into your main system or you are trying to utilize them for some other purpose leads to different types of work group functioning. So, the details about you can just refer to this paper which talks of the details of this cultural identities, diversity and work group functioning. Now, when we are talking of organizational role, what happens when these people enter into the organization, they enter a, they are given a position, a post and what is a role? Role is the expectations set by others from you and also you as a part of the things that you have to do in the organization. So, the, uh, when you join an organization, what you do is you join a specific role and this role is a particular functioning of the overall system of tasks that is assigned or given to the employee by the organization and what, what, what are the expectations from you as a part of that role that you are taking as a expectations from that particular position and also your own expectations from it like what you feel like you can do being in that position. So, it is divided into two parts like role as taken and role as given. So, what you can see if you can notice over here is this is a framework like given role is the job description and um, your authorization given this this is the interaction the juncture of the role as taken and role as given given is the job description performance measurement or evaluation others explicit and expects expressed expectations from you. What others expect from that role, then job descriptions and performance measurement or evaluation. Role as taken is what you, how you enact that role, what, what ideal you have about what you want to do from that role and what is your daily task routine that you have to do as a part of that role that you are taking. As a result, juncture of this is authorization means what you are given to do and what you take up as is the authorization and the responsibilities given to you. This whole role as you see role as taken and role as given functions within a system which is called a sentient system these and the task system. This task system consists of the role that belong to the structure, procedures and technologies which exist independently of individuals within the organization. So, the task system is independent of the organization, it is due to the structure procedures and technology certain expectations are there from the particular position the role and it is not based on the individual who is joining that role that is called the task system. And for the this part is like the system of task one consciously assumes is more easily recognizable part of role since conscious expectations are built in, performance measurement occurs and the individuals overtly work the role as taken. 
So, the extent to which one is authorized in this task emerges the formal space between taken and given. This means what the expectations are more or less known to you, it is based on the task structure that is given and the performance measurement occurs you know like um, con these are conscious expectations from you and you, you can get to measure it. But what happens when there is a sentient system is it is dependent on the social and human processes. The this is a very unconscious um, expectations Im having great emotional significance which, which is based again on the attitudes, beliefs, needs of the people within the organization. The, this is not, this is not within the like defined expectations, but you can sense these expectations from the system. And these are called covert expectations and may lead to certain role conflict and while you are trying attention and motivation. So, if you just look into this, the task system is the daily task routine, job description, performance measurement, sentient system is your, your intergroup dynamics then informal role sanction, resistance to change and all these factors. And when there is the task, uh, the task as you can see he is expecting something from you, but the sentient system is giving a different cue to you, formal and informal expectations are not matching the resources given to you and e your feeling what you can do and what you cannot do. Your the human beings feedback, if these two things are not matching, it gives rise to certain conflicts which are called role conflicts and role stress within that in individual and this part the intersection of these two, the task and the sentient system gives rise to certain stress factors and conflicting roles. Now, the productivity in the role is linked with how this role has taken and role has given and this task system and sentient system are well balanced with each other. So, this is if you see the role enactment and role conflict, how this is getting balanced if role has taken and role the less the distance, the less the distance between role as taken, role as given, task system and sentient system, the more is the productivity because people can manage their roles well. When we are coming to status, this is another important thing when people are interacting in the social dynamics, whether there is a, whether everybody is in the same platform or there is a somewhere you find like somebody is higher in power structure and somebody is lower in power structure and this is due to this is called the social rank and which we call by status and it is a um, status is the mark of the honor the amount of recognition esteem and acceptance given to the other person it depends on this see suppose this is a person and this person is giving a cues like everybody is trying to look up into this person for certain help then obviously this person enjoys a higher social status than these people based on his expertise to meet the needs of these other people so these things um, uh, this status is very important and how do we come to know about uh, status is through like through what employees feel important like it could be very minor things like the presence of waste basket in the um, presence of bookcases, important good pictures in your wall like whether you are sharing a corner office, whether um, there are windows in your room, whether you have a driver for your car 
all these small small things tells you about the status given to you in the organization. Like whether you have certain facilities like computers and um, whether with what is the dress that you wear and um, what, what is the title job title that you are having in your organization and what all memberships you are sharing in the organization like you are member of so many positions all these signify status that you have in the organization and whether you have a secretary or not this and these are important factors sources of status could be like education and the job level are two important sources of status others could be like your ability job skill and type of work are also sources of status other things are your seniority then the amount of pay that you get and the your age and the stock options that you are having something some factors that which tells you like okay this is what do you what for you are uh, recognized and that is why you are get getting certain uh, like um, ex, um, getting certain you know, better things from the organizations so with this we come to the end of um, lecture 3 and what we have covered over here is organization as a um, social system or well, what is a social system why there is a workforce diversity and how that diversity can be utilized by the employees uh, for their own growth and also by the organization for its purposes, its excel, excellence and effectiveness by in utilizing it for their utilizing the good part, learning from them for the different cultures and trying to utilize those things, those competencies in their main functioning or they are just utilized because uh, they are provided as a means to certain ends and whether the workforce diversity is maintained just to appear like a just organization or not and how these affects the functioning. Obviously, the organization which can utilize this workforce diversity is uh, for the utilize the competency of the workforce diversity and um, align it with the main purpose of the organization will be a better uh, performer because they are getting a huge spectrum of competencies from the human resources and also they have to keep into mind the psychological contract the expectations of these uh, different uh, individuals coming from different cultural diversity and try to align with their expectations. So, it, it's maintaining a workforce diversity is a um, great challenge as per as um, the organization is concerned maintaining a cultural diversity and utilizing it, developing it and make making it grow and also the organization grow together. It is a great challenge for the people, the management how to keep a balance so that there is a work life balance, better psychological contract and social equilibrium is there. And also what to expect from the roles, how to set realistic role expectation both from for the employees and for the from the employer's perspective, how, how to give status, what status to be given, if these are some good feeling factors that are given and how this is utilized to the for the main functioning of the organization. Thank you.